You're listening to the micro version of the Savage Love Cast at savage.love. If you're stuck in a relationship quandary, or if you're looking for sexual harmony, well, there's nothing you can't ask on the Savage Love Cast. It's Tuesday, November 7th, Election Day. Which means tonight we're going to find out whether performing sex acts for money on the internet with your husband is a disqualifier for public office, at least in the eyes of voters in Virginia's 57th district, where nurse practitioner Susanna Gibson secured the Democratic nomination in an important swing seat in a race for the Virginia House of Delegates in a closely divided state, and then was outed as an amateur porn star by a Republican operative who sent the live sex tapes Gibson made with her husband on Chatterbait to the Washington Post. Chatterbait, the number one website for chatty masturbators everywhere. Like I said, when the Gibson story first broke, I wanna live in a world where what happens on the internet stays on the internet. I wanna live in a world where people meet and flirt and swap pics and videos and fuck online and can even have fun, sexy adventures with their spouses online. And that part of their life, their online life, their online sex life, is regarded as private. So long as no one forces anyone to watch their videos or look at their dick pics, no one would be penalized for their online kind of private, but sort of kind of public, it really depends on the context, behavior. We half live in the world I want to live in already. People meet and flirt, swap pics and videos, and fuck online and have sexy adventures with their spouses. But right now, we all do it at great personal and professional risk. And this strikes me as untenable. If for no other reason than most of us, almost all of us, have some dirty shit out there on the internet. If not photos and videos, then those digital breadcrumbs, likes, favorites, saves, cookies, browser histories. And even if you've never shared a dirty photo privately or visited a porn site privately, someone you love, someone you may want to see succeed in life, definitely has. So not judging people or shaming them or outing them or voting against them for doing dirty shit online, even if you wouldn't personally benefit from embracing the new social norm I'm proposing here, a new social norm I think we need to adopt, even if you wouldn't benefit from it personally, your kids might. You know, your kids who are right now swapping pics and videos and sending explicit sex messages to what I hope are their age-appropriate sex partners without much thought for the future for where they're going to want to be in 10 years or much thought for what might come back to haunt them one day. So yeah, I'm glad the election is today because carrying contradictory ideas around in your own head, which I've been doing since the Susanna Gibson story broke is really kind of exhausting. On the one hand, I don't think Gibson should have run for office with those videos out there. She shouldn't have run for a crucial seat in a closely divided state legislature with those videos out there when our democracy hangs by a thread. The stakes are just too high. On the other hand, I think Gibson should be able to express herself sexually online and accept tips from viewers who want to see her perform certain sex acts with her husband and then also be able to run for office. That's the world I want to live in. And she should have been able to do all of that without... These videos, well, I want to say being made public, but it was Gibson and her husband who made their videos public. So how about this? And this is, again, the new social norm I'm proposing. I think Gibson should have been able to run for office without her sex videos being made any more public than Gibson and her husband made them in the first place. And if voters are going to punish anyone for finding out about those videos, seems to me it should be the politician or the party that brought them to wider public attention than Gibson and her husband intended. Basically, if someone posts something sexually explicit online, but posts it in a place where sexually explicit content is wanted, expected, and welcomed, they shouldn't face social or professional or political sanction. There is a difference between posting your dick pic to the Rate My Cock subreddit and sending your dick pic unsolicited to a stranger. And speaking of sending unsolicited explicit images to strangers, take it away, Channel 12 News, Richmond, Virginia, on your side. Two weeks away from Election Day and Virginia's Republican Party taking further steps to warn voters of the online sex scandal surrounding House candidate Susanna Gibson. 
those further steps that the Virginia Republican Party is taking, mailing screenshots of the porn Gibson made with her husband to the homes of thousands and thousands of voters all across Virginia's 57th district. Back to Channel 12 News on your side, Riley Wyant reporting. These flyers began showing up in mailboxes in the 57th House District. The outside says do not open if you are under the age of 18 and warning explicit material enclosed. Inside are censored quotes and screenshots from Democrat Susanna Gibson's public porn live stream. In these videos, she allegedly performed sex acts with her husband and asked viewers to pay them money. All right, that was reporter Riley Wyant live and on your side, unless you're Susanna Gibson. It seems pretty clear to me that Channel 12 News, which hands the mic to Republican Governor Glenn Youngkin, is not on Gibson's side. Here's what Governor Youngkin had to say about Gibson. This candidate's personal life is something that that candidate needs to explain to people, and the Democratic Party needs to have an opinion on this. Actually, Governor... No, this candidate's personal life isn't something she should have to explain to people, just as your personal life isn't something you should have to explain to people. And her personal life would have remained personal and private, or private-ish, or private-adjacent, and not requiring a public explanation if Republican campaign operatives and the Republican Party of Virginia hadn't. What is that expression Republicans use? When a gay person has sex in private but sometimes leaves the house without taking the closet with him, oh right, Gibson's private life would have remained private if the Virginia GOP hadn't shoved it down all our throats and into the mailboxes of 57th District voters in Virginia. One Republican voter, Channel 12, spoke to said that the flyer stunt mailing porn to the homes of thousands of voters seemed a tad extreme. You think, Republican voter? You are the party of banning books and drag shows to protect children from explicit content. And now you're also the party of mailing screenshots of porn videos to people's homes in envelopes designed to attract the attention of porn-starved teenagers. You want someone under 18 to look at something? Put it in an envelope that says not to be opened by anyone under the age of 18 and mail it to their parents. I don't want to overstate the potential harm here or the reach. When I was a kid, porn was scarce. If that envelope had come in the mail to my house when I was a kid and I got home before mom and dad did, I would have steamed that shit open in a hot second. Most of today's kids wouldn't bother. You know, today's kids with their cell phones and laptops and access to all the pornography ever created in all of recorded human history From the Venus of Willendorf to the Warren Cup to Debbie Does Dallas to the two minutes or less collabs monetized by content creators today on OnlyFans and, yes, Chatterbait. Quick aside, if you've never heard of the Warren Cup, you're going to want to Google the Warren Cup. You can thank me later. All right, kids with smartphones, they're not going to be impressed by what's in that envelope. But kids with terrible religious parents... Every homeschooled kid in Virginia, and there are lots of homeschooled kids in Virginia, kids without access to the internet, kids whose parents won't let them have phones. Yeah, that envelope and what's inside it? A drop of water in the desert, manna from heaven, a reach around, courtesy of the Virginia GOP. Anyway, I am on the edge of my seat here, anxious to find out whether voters in Virginia are going to punish Susanna Gibson for her semi-private consensual sexual conduct with her lawfully married husband, or if they're going to punish the Virginia GOP for shoving that content through their mail slots and down their throats. Whatever happens, I feel for Susanna Gibson and her husband and her kids. She should have known better than to get in the race in the first place because we don't live in the world I want to live in. And I don't get to dictate new social norms. Not yet. But Susanna Gibson did not deserve this. But would I feel the same? Would I be saying all these same things if Gibson weren't a pro-choice Democrat who wants to ban assault weapons and protect LGBT rights and get us off fossil fuels and onto renewable energy? Would I be saying all these same things if Gibson were the Republican mayor of a small town who was also a Baptist minister and once hugged Donald Trump in public after a tornado devastated his community? If his explicit photos were splashed all over the internet, 
Would I be coming to his defense and proposing one or two new social norms? Well, it's not a hypothetical. F.L. Bubba Copeland was the Republican mayor of a small town in Alabama. And I'm referring to him in the past tense here because F.L. Bubba Copeland killed himself last week after a conservative news website outed him as Brittany Blair, a quote unquote curvy girl who enjoyed being a whore and getting fucked and wrote trans themed erotica. When confronted with his double life or his alter ego, Copeland said it was just a fantasy and he cross dressed to blow off steam and that only his wife was aware of his online activities. He also said he wasn't trans, which is why I'm using he, him pronouns here. And he begged the website that contacted him about his online activities not to publish, but they did anyway. I'm against the outing of Susanna Gibson, and I'm against the outing of F.L. Bubba Copeland. And just as I feel for Gibson and her husband and her kids, I feel for Copeland and his wife and his three kids. Politics is a nasty business. Outing someone is a brutal tactic, a brutal tactic that should be reserved for brutes. And I don't think Copeland was a brute. Just as the videos Gibson posted online should have stayed in the places where she posted them, places where people who wanted to see that kind of content could find it, the stuff Copeland posted should have stayed where he posted it too. And I would hope that if Copeland had lived, he could have resolved his inner conflict and his inner contradictions. And if he was trans, that he could have come out and lived as a woman, or could have come out and lived as a bisexual man or a straight male cross-dresser or whatever it is that he was. And that when he came out, he also got the fuck out of the Republican Party. All right, coming up on the micro Savage Lovecast, tons of your cues, lots of my A's. And speaking of your cues, we love your questions. Please keep them coming. I just wanted to say, looking over the cues this week, last week, all from people in open relationships or polyamorous relationships, we love you, people in open or poly relationships. Love your questions. And like everyone in your polycule, keep them coming. I just wanted to let you monogamous folks know you can ask me anything too. And I promise I will be supportive of your lifestyle choice. That's on the micro. Q's, A's on the magnum. Julie Klausner joins me. She co-created and starred in Difficult People with Billy Eichner. I asked her on the show under false pretenses. I pretended I just wanted her on the show to give a little bit of sex advice and have some fun. But actually... I wanted her to come on the show and talk about Schmigadoon and Schmicago. If you're a musical theater fan, you are going to love our conversation. We also do give together, me and Julie, a little bit of sex advice. That's coming up on the Magnum. All right, on to today's show. This episode of The Lovecast is brought to you by the good folks at Squarespace. They make it easy to build a beautiful website, blog, or online store. Head on over to squarespace.com slash savage for a free trial. And when you're ready to launch, use the offer code SAVAGE to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. This episode is brought to you by Talkspace, therapy made easy. Get $80 off your first month when you go to talkspace.com slash savage. This episode of the Savage Lovecast is brought to you by Dipsy. Dipsy is an app full of hundreds of short, sexy audio stories designed by women for women. Get an extended 30-day free trial when you go to dipsystories.com slash savage. Hi, Dan. I am a midwife calling with a question. I have clients who have babies that are born with tongue ties, and I always recommend that they leave them if their nursing's not a problem. But if they have a problem with nursing, then uh, they get them clipped by a dentist. And now I have friends that also have problems with um, their lovers not being able to give proper cuddling as, as adults because their lovers are tongue-tied. And I'm thinking maybe that advice I've been giving is poor and babies should be, you know, advised to clip for future cunnilingus giving. Also, should these adults get their tongue ties revised or clipped by a dentist? Or should they figure out another way to pleasure their partners using hands and toys and less tongue? Because some of them are literally gagging during it or they can't last very long. And it's a very big turnoff to the women I've talked to. I Googled this and read three articles about it, which means I am now an expert on ankyloglossia or tongue tie. That's when the lingual frenulum 
is a little thick or fibrous and it connects to not the base of the tongue or the root of the tongue like it's supposed to or does in most folks, but to the tip of the tongue, restricting movement of the tongue in or out of the mouth that can also interfere then with speech or as you have discovered from some of your friends, the ability to perform cunnilingus and I'm going to just climb out on a limb here, although it's not on the Mayo Clinic's website, I'm going to assume also might interfere with the ability to eat ass. What can you do about it? Well, in infants, of course, as you know, if it interferes with breastfeeding, it may need to be clipped so the infant doesn't starve to death. But in most people who suffer from tongue-tied syndrome as little infant children, it resolves itself in time, but not in all people. And if it doesn't resolve itself, it can interfere with functioning, with speech, with eating pussy or eating ass. And then what do you do? Well, if it interferes with speech, I think at some point a responsible parent will take a kid in to have that surgically corrected. It is, as I've read just now, which makes me an expert, a minor procedure and a recommended one in many cases where it hasn't resolved in early childhood, where it hasn't detached all on its own in early childhood. Should the men, the male partners of the women you know who are unsatisfied with their inability to eat pussy to their satisfaction, get their thick frenulums that are attached to the tips of their tongues that aren't, I assume, interfering with eating, drinking, or speech, but are interfering with cunnilingus? Should those men get those things at this late stage clipped for their partner's satisfactions? Well, I think that's up to those dudes. It really is up to the men whose bodies, whose tongues, whose lingual frenulums we're talking about here. If that's something that they would like to do, if eating pussy is something that they enjoy or that their partners enjoy and they would like to get better at and would take enjoyment in their partner's increased enjoyment of their ability to eat pussy better, then it would be a perfectly rational choice. But there are risks if somebody has a certain lingual frenulum arrangement that they've lived with all their lives and they don't have a speech impediment because they've, you know, they grew up with that tongue and they learned how to use it for speech and eating. They may need some time to get used to that tongue again. Could potentially, and I'm just theorizing here, wind up with, at least for a while, that's what temporarily means, right? A speech impediment, a brand new speech impediment. And these may be men who in childhood, because of their lingual frenulums, because of having tongue-tied syndrome, who conquered a speech impediment in childhood may wind up with a brand new one temporarily in adulthood. That could, I think, for some folks, be traumatic, and it might be something that they want to take into consideration before they you know, decide to prioritize their partner's pleasure or their pleasure and the pleasure that they could possibly give their partner if they got this procedure done over the tongue they've gotten to know and learn to work around and work with over the course of their entire lives. This episode is brought to you by Dipsy. They know that in these troubled times, sometimes self-care is best achieved by getting yourself off with a super sexy audio story. Dipsy brings scenarios to life with immersive soundscapes and realistic characters. Discover stories about second chance romances, adventurous vacation flings, hot and heavy hookups, and now cowboy werewolves. Here's the description. When Dan invites the pack over for the full moon, he asks Wilder to take you camping so they're free to turn and hunt. Wilder's pissed. For starters, he's tired of being ordered around by Dan, but worse than that, he keeps having dreams about you. And when an accident out on the trail forces you to share a tent for the night, the tension is higher than ever. Ow! Dipsy has stories for straight and queer listeners, and 56% of stories are voice acted by people of color. New content is released every week, so in between listening to your favorite stories again and again, you can always find something new to explore. They also have soothing sleep stories, wellness sessions, and games you can play with a partner, a sexting tutorial, and tons of other classes and sexy stories that you can read. It really is, I'm sort of joking around, but it really is about self-care. It's amazing. Let Dipsy be your go-to place to spice up your me time, explore your fantasies, relax and unwind, and add joy with a partner. 
For listeners to the show, Dipsy is offering an extended 30-day free trial when you go to dipsystories.com slash savage. That's 30 days of free access for free when you go to D-I-P-S-E-A stories.com slash savage. Dipsystories.com slash savage. Hi, Dan. I'm a cis bi female in my late 30s. I'm married to a cis bi man and we've been together for six years. We've always had a fun sex life together and I feel safe and loved in our relationship. There's just one problem. I cry during sex. This has been going on for months now. It starts as starting to feel overwhelmed and then turns into crying and sometimes into a full-blown panic attack. This usually happens during PIV, but not exclusively. It used to happen infrequently, but now it happens almost every time we have sex, which makes me not want to have sex at all. I do not have a history of sexual trauma, at least that I can remember, and I am not having any physical pain when these feelings start to overcome me. I've recently started working on this in therapy, but I'm curious if this is something that you, your experts, or other listeners have any thoughts on. Dan, please help me have sex to completion again. Ran this by a couple of experts, a couple of therapists that I sometimes spitball questions with, and they both said that they didn't have much to say except good idea that you're in therapy and you should stay in therapy. I hesitate even to speculate about what could be going on. If it's something about your partner, if sex with your partner is stirring up these big, overwhelming, inexplicable feelings, well, the quickest way to test that is have sex with somebody else and see if you are similarly overwhelmed. If you have no memory of sexual assault, no history of sexual trauma, Not only do I take your word at that for that, I would warn you off any therapist who tried to suggest that there was some buried history of sexual trauma that you don't remember and with their help you might be able to uncover. The recovered memory movement destroyed a lot of lives, ruined a lot of relationships, nuked a lot of families. I don't think you want to go down that route with that particular kind of therapist or those particular kinds of suggestions, but something is going on here. I am playing your call though, to toss it out there to any listeners who may have gone through something similar where sex that you enjoyed suddenly was stirring up big feelings, big, overwhelming, inexplicable feelings. And you found yourself crying after sex and not a good cry that you enjoyed, but a bad cry that ruined it for you, that really disincentivized being sexual or intimate with your partner at all. If you went through that, you've got something to share, please jump into the comments at savage.love or give us a call, share your thoughts. We'll play them on an upcoming show. And caller, my only advice to you would be to get into therapy and you are in therapy. So my only advice to you would be stay in therapy and work through this and work it out and check back with us soon, hopefully, for the perspective and insight of other Savage Lovecast listeners who face something similar. Here on the Lovecast, to my callers, I frequently recommend getting into therapy. I know how important it can be, especially around the holidays, to have help. Do you think seeing a therapist or psychiatrist would be helpful to you, but you don't have the time to go find one and meet with them or get to appointments or you where you can't afford it? Try Talkspace. By doing everything online, Talkspace has made getting the help you want, the help you need, help you might benefit from, accessible and affordable. With Talkspace, you can sign up online and get a personalized match with a provider that's right for you, typically within 48 hours. It is incredibly convenient to have virtual online sessions with your licensed therapist from the comfort of your own home. There's no need to commute to appointments. You don't have to miss time at work or line up childcare in order to attend your sessions. It's mental health care made easy. Talkspace can help with any specific challenge you might be facing. It is the number one online therapy platform with licensed therapists in over 40 specialties, including anxiety, depression, substance abuse, relationship issues, and much more. Talkspace is affordable and in-network with most major insurers. As a listener of this podcast, you'll get $80 off your first month with Talkspace when you go to Talkspace.com slash savage. To match with a licensed therapist today, go to Talkspace.com slash savage to get $80 off your first month and show your support for the Lovecast. That's Talkspace.com slash savage. Hi, Dan. I am a 
single queer woman in a rural area. I found myself entangled with a woman who said she was in an open marriage, in which I said, fine, because, like, I'm not really looking for a girlfriend right now because I just got out of a relationship, like, a month ago. Anyways, we ended up getting a little emotionally entangled and fast forward to where it's the point where she was saying her wife and her were don't ask, don't tell, but now she feels unethical. She feels like she's in love with me and needs to tell her wife. But I'm just concerned because we haven't actually been seeing each other in like person for more than like two weeks. We were chatting online for like a long period of time, like almost a month, but doesn't that seem like a little fast and I feel like I'm being less bombed and I feel like I want to say it's too soon to, like, make it so serious because what if I don't want to be, like, a fixture in their marriage, but also I don't want to, like, enable cheating because I guess it would be cheating if she, uh, you know, crossed their boundary. I'm just really, I don't know what to do. I don't know how to, like, stay kind of far away without losing contact forever or I don't know how to impress this wife and make her like me because... She doesn't like me. I am kind of close to men. Probably going to be left out. But any advice on yeah, how to win over someone's wife? So lesbian stereotypes much? <laughs> yeah. Like you've only known this person for an instant and they want to blow up their open relationship agreement with their wife because they're falling in love with you and kicking off, um, I know you identified as queer, but what sounds to me like a lot of cliche dyke drama. <laughs> yeah, that is true. Um, you actually got to me a little late and I already went over and it went like super, super well. So I don't know why I doubted myself. Oh my God. <laughs> but yeah, I was really, really scared. But um, I don't so, know how I did it. So the wife took it well? Yeah. And um, I was just over last night for like Halloween activities with the both of them. And I have birthday presents lined up from both of them too now, I'm pretty sure. Wait, birthday presents from both of them or for both of them? Yeah, from both of them. Yep. I've been hanging out with the wife separately now, one on one. We have a dinner date next week. <laughs> oh my god! Okay, well let's like shift gears here. Welcome to th welcome to Thruppledom. Yeah, if, I don't, it's not. It's definitely not official. Okay, but you're kind of dating both of them now. Yeah, yeah, that is true. I'm kind of praying they're not. I don't think they're podcasts. And you're projecting people. yourself into a future. I am projecting myself into the future Thrupple, That's for <laughs> sure. But <laughs> where you will have to explain this relationship to your friends and family. Or not, or I just won't, or I'll just say that they're my friends and then have everyone uh, question my friendship with women. You know, I think there's two approaches when it comes to rolling out a thruple for friends and family, and I've rolled out a couple of thruples to friends and family. This is going to seem thruple shamey, <laughs> or that there's some higher standard for thruples. But ideally, uh, in my experience, if you wait until you guys have actually been together for a year or more as a thruple before you, you know, roll the thruple out, people take it more seriously. Yeah. Um, and, <laughs> you know, you don't want people to, their, their, their relationships to exist in shadows. You know, if people can't open up or confide to family and friends about who they're dating and how they're feeling and how it's going, that person is vulnerable to, you know, exploitation and we need our friends and family to bounce shit yeah. off of. So identify a couple of people you can tell right away besides all of my listeners what's going on and who can, you know, be there for you if you need some advice or you want to run something through somebody else's bullshit detectors. But if you want your family to take it seriously, particularly your family, it's almost better to introduce a, a thruple as an existing couple that concern, I know. As, as a long-term relationship already as opposed to I've just started dating a couple mom and dad <laughs> and I'm excited about the possibilities. Mom and dad will freak out. If you say to mom and dad, I've been dating this couple for a year and I know this isn't the kind of relationship that you probably imagined for me or have ever really heard about, but it's great for me and I'd like you to meet them. I think parents, I know parents are more comfortable with 
that rollout, that I just met someone who happens to be married to somebody else. Yeah. They could get sick of me in a month. So who knows? Which is another <laughs> reason not to like, yeah, not to schedule the red carpet premiere exactly. prematurely. You were, you're already doing a lot of like lesbian premature shit. Like yeah, I'm in love definitely. with you after two weeks. Sometimes happens, not just to lesbians. <laughs> And I want you to meet the wife and we want to rewrite our open relationship agreement to allow for the relationship I want to have with you. Like <laughs> there's a lot uh, happening here. And so yeah. I would, if I were you, delay <laughs> the debut, the red carpet, <laughs> put that shit off. Yeah. My friends are already questioning me, but I'm having fun right now. So that's all that matters. <laughs> And that is all that matters. And you know what? If it comes to shit, like if it doesn't work out, hopefully, you know, if it doesn't work out, it's a, you know, you part as friends and they're good people. Um, When I say come to shit, I don't mean it like terrible things happen. (laughs) But if it doesn't work out, don't let people blame throupledom for that. No. You know, most relationships don't work out. I don't think they listen to podcasts either. But hope, maybe if they hear this, they'll be like, what the hell? Why'd you have to call a podcast? And I'll be like, that's not me. That's just some other bitch that sounds like me. What are you talking about? <laughs> why not a call bit. a podcast? I know. Why you're not telling you. You had to tell somebody about this because yeah. you're excited about it. And my God, I was calling you to say like, whoa, maybe tap the brakes only to find <laughs> out that you guys had already Thelma, Louis- Thelma and Louise this shit right off the cliff. Yeah, a little bit. A little but- bit. But the car didn't crash. You guys are and sailing no. through the air. So far. But, but don't let people tell you. Like, people say this all the time to anybody who's poly or dating couples or non-monogamous. If it doesn't work out, they're like, ah, look, that shit never works out. But they don't say that about monogamous relationships exactly. or one-on-one relationships or dating that doesn't work out, which most monogamous or one-on-one relationships don't work out. And then nobody yeah. says, oh, yeah, that, like, monogamy shit, that's always a disaster. This might be a disaster yeah. or it might just be, like, a good relationship for a month or two or while you're transitioning out of the long-term relationship you just got out of or it might be forever yeah exactly well enjoy it i hope it's not a disaster <laughs> i'm glad to hear your voice dan i'm so so happy to meet you uh, i'm glad to hear your voice too <laughs> and maybe i have to examine my own prejudice about thruples or open relationships because i was called on to say run even though i've been in open relationships and thruples myself that were successful and Still are. Yeah. We just move faster, I guess. Well, good luck. <laughs> give us, a, you know Thank what? It you. could it could end in a couple of months, like you said, but give us a call back in a couple of months and let us know where you're at. I will. I totally will. Hey, dude. Are you in a band? Or are you working on a side business selling stuff you make? Or maybe you're doing some political work or community organizing? Then you should have a great looking website that works perfectly on every kind of screen. And no, do not tell me you can code it all yourself. You cannot. Squarespace can, and you'll get your site launched quickly, drama-free. You can sell custom merch and create an easy income stream that engages your audience and spreads the word about you. Design your products, and production, inventory, and shipping are handled for you, saving you time, money, and thus making you the hero of your posse. Sell your products in an online store. Whether you sell physical, digital, or service products, Squarespace has the tools you need to start selling online. It's easy to get started with Squarespace. They offer professional website templates with designs for every category and use case. Then you can customize your look, update content, and add features to fit your unique needs. You can make any Squarespace template do what you want so your idea, brand, or business stands out online on every device. Head on over to squarespace.com for a free trial. And when you're ready to launch, go to squarespace.com slash savage and use the offer code savage to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. That's squarespace.com slash savage and use the offer code savage. Hey, Dan, I have a question regarding episode 886. You said at some point that the drag queen Jinx Monsoon uh, said something great on her podcast. But I thought drag queens establish our men who dress up as women but are, are not trans people themselves. So when you say her, are they only hers or she's when they're in costume or are they he's? And maybe you meant to say, I, I'm, I'm kind of confused because I know with, the tr- with trans people, it's a her and a she or he and her, him, depending on how they identify always, right? But 
Is it just the case with drag queens that whenever they're essentially in character, they are that gender? Uh, and then when they're not, they aren't? If some guy did drag one night, or, you know, some gay guy did drag occasionally, you wouldn't call him she or her. That's just some dude who sometimes does drag. Somebody like Jinx Monsoon, somebody like RuPaul, somebody like the late, great Crystal Lane in Seattle, you called them she, her, even when they were out of drag. Didn't mean that they were identified as women or were women. What it was was a marker of respect because drag was their career. Drag was what they did professionally and for a living. And drag was, you know, their professional identity, but also because there's a huge social element to drag. Drag queens, before they burst onto all of our TV screens and showed up in our libraries reading books to four-year-olds, drag queens were mostly found in gay bars. And the only time you ever saw a drag queen in the light was on the Sunday of Pride, melting at noon on a float. And so, you know, you called Crystal Lane, who was a the RuPaul of Seattle back in the day, you called Crystal, she, you called Crystal Crystal, her drag name all the time as a marker of respect for what she did for a living and what she did so well, which was drag. And, you know, there was, it, it's hard for people to remember now, but drag 20, 30, 40 years ago was really stigmatized, even in the gay community, there was this sense that guys who did drag were pathetic and guys who did drag made us all look bad. And I was a guy who drag. I don't think drag queens made us look bad. I think I was a pretty good drag queen. I think I made us look good. But it was not uncommon to hear from gay guys that drag was obnoxious, that drag queens were obnoxious. It was not uncommon to hear from gay guys that they would never date somebody who was a drag queen because there were gay guys who wanted to pretend that nobody did drag. And, you know, when a drag queen like me back in the day, when I was out of drag, my drag friends, my, the other queens that I knew would refer to me as she. And it was a way of reminding the people who were more comfortable with us out of drag that we were still queens, that we were still drag queens, and that maybe their discomfort with us when we were in drag was something that they were going to have to fucking live with, whether we were in drag or not. So there was something, and I say this as a former drag queen myself, there was something about, there was something in your face and confrontational about the way Crystal Lane would be identified as a she, her, even out of drag. It sort of through their drag personas, their drag skills, profession, their drag identity into the faces of everybody all the time. That even when this person wasn't in drag, they were still proudly a queen and that their majesty needed to be respected and recognized, not just when they were in drag, but at all times. It's a different reason for using she, her than a trans woman might use she, her, but it's a perfectly valid reason for someone like Jinx or Rue or Crystal to use she, her. All right. Before we get to this week's listener response calls, I want to share a couple of comments about last week's show or last week's shows that were posted at savage.love. Says inspired desires to the introvert high libido guy. Have you looked into the local BDSM communities? Hop on Fet Life and go to some munches. Low time commitment. The community is absolutely full of introverts who don't like clubs and nerdy pursuits are everywhere. There are no fewer than three different groups in Utah that have done board game nights and I'm sure a sexy poker night would be a smash hit. Says Mudflap33 about the sex and politics episode with comedian Trey Crowder. I really enjoyed this one. I think it can be so important for leftists in other parts of the country to hear from leftists in and from the South. A year or so ago, my spouse and I moved from California to a mid-sized city in the South, in part because I have family here, and it has been fantastic. The South has a lot of problems. America has a lot of problems, but there are plenty of good people here willing to put in the work and fight the fight. There's a lot more to Mudflaps. Comment, go to the episode with Trey Crowder of Sex and Politics at Savage.love to read the whole thing. And finally, says Andrew, 
The Hindu glory hole story is obviously an urban legend. Is it even plausible? Are there party venues in Amsterdam that have glory holes with an automated reveal switch? And if so, whatever for? Yeah, that story was clearly bullshit. I thought I kind of sort of telegraphed that when it came up in my intro. But that story did confirm all my priors about glory holes, which made that story a story that was too good to check. Vice actually did a deep dive into the Amsterdam glory hole story, headlined the truth behind the viral Amsterdam glory hole, voice note by Zing Chang. So if you want more, if you can't get enough about that Amsterdam glory hole story and you want to read all about what a big pile of steaming bullshit it was, check out Zing Chang's story at Vice. All right, for more listener comments and more of my responses, check out Struggle Session, the weekly bonus column exclusively for Magnum subs at savage.love. For all the perks of being my sub, go to savage.love slash subscribe. And now, listener response calls. Hi, this is a response call for the caller that Trey Crowder and Dan addressed in the most recent Sex and Politics. Dan's right, there are more guns than people in the United States, and you should assume that most houses you walk into will have a gun. If you don't like that, work for gun control, make local laws that require people to have a gun safe and keep their guns locked away. Also, Dan's right, maybe don't look in people's doors as soon as they walk out of the room. This is in response to the episode 888 and the hypersexual loner. I know so many dudes like this in in the nerd world um, who build themselves up by talking about how like smart they are and how hypersexual they are. And they just can't find anybody, any women who could possibly also enjoy the intellectual pursuits that they like. And it's all a load of Kafka, Fedora, Madeir bullshit. Maybe you're not lonely. Maybe you just wanted to do a humble brag about how like big your boner is, but you kind of come off as a sexist prick, which might be might be causing some of the problems that you are experiencing if you are trying to connect with women out in the world. Otherwise, if you want to, you could go to card game nights or you could go um, join a fucking book club or like you know, talk to people about coding. Lots of women like math and coding, my friend. It's not, it's not just you. It's not just dudes. Hey, Dan. This is a response to the self-described hypersexual loner. I also think of myself as a loner, but my wife is even more of a loner than I am. We have a great connection and we just really need a lot of our own space and alone time. And I know that's healthy for any kind of relationship, but I guess loners just need it a little bit more and it works great. We've been married for 13 wonderful years and we're even making plans to open up our marriage once our kids get a little bit older. So I highly recommend seeking out your fellow loner. Loners make great mates. And we're going to leave it there. Got a question for next week's Lovecast or something to say about something I said on this week's Lovecast? You can record your question right now at savage.love slash askdan, or you can use the voice memo app on your phone and email your question to q at savage.love or pretend it's the 1990s and call our actual landline and leave us a locally sourced small batch vocal cord crafted voicemail at 206-302-2064. The deadline for entering Hump 2024 is coming right up December 8th, a month away. Hump films don't have to be elaborate productions, although some are and we love those. A short, dirty video that you made for a partner or with a partner that's on your phone right now with a little zhuzhing, the title card, a little music, your dirty little movie that's already on your phone could be a winning Hump film. Many of the best films at Hump every year are made at the last minute. Lots are shot on iPhones and some are just sexy, sexy, but very compelling short video clips. Go to humpfilmfest.com right now for all the details you need on submitting your dirty little masterpiece to my dirty little film festival. Humpfilmfest.com slash submit. Follow me on Instagram and threads at Dan Savage. Follow me at Blue Sky, also at Dan Savage. Follow Julie Klausner on Instagram and TikTok at Julie Klausner and get her podcast, Double Threat, that she co-hosts with Tom Sharpling on all podcast platforms. The Savage Lovecast is produced every week by Nancy Hartunian and me and Nancy and the tech savvy at risk youth. We will all be back at you next week with another installment of the Savage Lovecast. Thank you for downloading.